Now, okay. I'll introduce you later. Okay, thank you. Keep it a mystery till I'll back. <laughs> you don't know who I am. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good morning. to see you this morning. Enjoyed your uh, congregational singing. What a great song to start off on. Praising our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is certainly worthy of it, is he not? Yes, That's where you're supposed to say amen or yes or something like amen. that. Hey, it is good to see you. And uh, looking forward to the time that we get together this week, this morning. Of course, I'm here for Sunday school and for the morning service. Hey, y'all. And then um, for the evening service tonight. Is that at 6 o'clock tonight? Yes. Okay, so 6 o'clock tonight and then 7 o'clock, I believe, throughout uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then Thursday and Friday, we're going to be out at Miami Beach. Or about out at Miami, rather. And uh, looking forward to the time where we can uh, minister out there as well. Uh, let's take our Bibles this morning. Turn with me, please, to the book of Psalms. And we're going to look together at a very familiar psalm, and it's familiar for a reason. Psalm number one. So, in the middle of their Bible, Psalm number one. If you hit Nehemiah, that means you need to go to the right, or Job to the right. If you hit Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, or Song of Solomon, or Isaiah, take a left, and you'll get to uh, the book of Psalms fairly quickly. And we're going to look at Psalm number 1 in just a moment. Psalm 1. All right, so Pastor said to leave it a mystery who we are, so I won't tell you anything about us so he can introduce us and uh, make up great stories. Pa Pastor, Pastor and I have known each other for a lot of years now. I mean, as a lot of years as we young people can have anyway. Yeah, five. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so it's a great privilege for us to be here. It's always good to see everybody again. Of course, we got to work together yesterday at the outreach. By the way, if you didn't know, um, for those who are working at the um, three-on-three tournament, um, or if, if you weren't able to be here or didn't know about it, we had two respond in the invitation and said that they trusted Jesus Christ as a Savior. And both of them would have been older teenagers. And uh, I, I think it was obvious that that they understood what was happening. So I'm very thankful for that. So we thank God for that, and we'll look for opportunities then to be able to help them. You know, the moment you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, there's a, there is a, in your life, you make a turn, and all of a sudden, everybody that was for you, pushing you in one direction, is now against you, trying to go in the opposite direction. And that's a lot for anybody, but especially for a young person who um, all of a sudden might feel push on the inside and from friends without to go in the opposite direction of where God would have them to go. So we need to pray for them and uh, pray for good opportunities to be able to help them to follow the Lord and, and to continue to do what's right. All right, Psalm number one, great Psalm and uh, a, good, a good start for us here this morning. Real quickly, before we, read, before we read the Psalm together, let me ask you a question, and this is Sunday school, so I'm going to invite your response, and it's fine for you to speak out loud. Mm -hmm. If you were to try to boil down um, what it is that every person is searching for, seeking for, uh, because all of us have all of us have at least one thing that we're all seeking for. What, what would you What would you think that everybody everybody wants? What is What is everybody searching? for? Happiness or peace? Okay, happiness, peace. Great, great two answers. Any, any, uh, any other thoughts? Acceptance. Acceptance. Love. Money. A lot of people, a lot of people are looking for money. Um, I, I heard somebody else say love. Is that right? Okay. So, okay, all of these, all of these have are legitimate answers as far <laughs> as, um, especially depending on your perspective. I think they all do come back to one point. And I think that's what Psalm 1 talks about. In fact, the very first word of Psalm number 1 is the word blessed. And the word blessed uh, in, in, the, in the Hebrew, which is the, what this was originally written in. In Hebrew, the, the language is very picturesque. So think of trying to write almost in charades, uh, where you're trying to picture certain emotions or feelings or thoughts. Uh, not not so not so much that it is every word is defined the way that our English language is, but think in pictures. The word blessed literally has the idea of a sigh of happiness, kind of a <sighs> uh, I think of this most often, not a yawn, Brother Andrew, a sigh of happiness. Now get it, get it straight, pal. All right. Um, think of, think of uh, when you were in school, for those of you whose school has been a few years ago, or if you're in school now, if you had a project that was due, 
And at least if you're anything like I am, a little bit of a procrastinator, at least on the final part of it. And so right at the day that it's due, you're printing it out and you're stapling it together on the way to class. And you get to class and, you know, if you don't turn it in the day that it's due, then you start losing letter grades and it's a big deal. So you bring it in, you just get it finished, hot off the press, stapled together. You walk in just as the bell rings for class. You put it down on the teacher's desk. You go sit in your desk or in your chair and you go... Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it, Brother Andrew. You just go, like, oh, I am so glad that is finished. That is the idea of the word blessed. And really, honestly, all the other things that a person can mention, Anthony, you've mentioned about people are seeking money, and that's true. Um, love was mentioned. Peace was mentioned. A number of all these things. But all of those things we seek for in our lives because we think to ourselves, either money or love or acceptance or peace, these things are going to finally let me be happy or blessed. Okay, so God made us this way, and he doesn't leave us wondering how it is that we can live with a blessed life. And he gives us instruction here in Psalm number one. So let's read it together. Psalm number one, and we're going to read through the entire psalm. It's just six verses. You were just standing a moment ago, but if you're physically able, would you mind standing with me as we read the scriptures? This is just to show respect for the scriptures and to help refresh our brains because um, at least if you're anything like I am, when I'm not preaching and I come in for Sunday school, my mind is on a lot of different things. So right now, while we're reading, is the time for us to discipline our attention to the reason why we've come so it's not a wasted Sunday school hour. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But this blessed man's delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he med meditate day and night. And this blessed man shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his leaf and his uh, that bringeth forth his fruit rather in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so; they're not blessed. They don't they don't have these things mentioned in verse three, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Father, help us please in the Sunday school hour to learn the things that we need to learn. I pray for the teenagers that are in the auditorium right now that they would get this, that it would start to make sense. You, re you have repeated this concept to us so many times throughout the scriptures. I know, um, I know that it's valuable just based upon how many times you've said, in essence, the same thing. And I'm confident that if all of us young and those of us who are adults and even older adults, if we will grab a hold of what you say here, that it will change our lives and help us to be able to live the blessed life you intend for us to live. And so, Lord, help me, please, to be able to explain in a way that's easy to be understood, the truth of what your word says. Holy Spirit of God, I need your help. I confess that. I am not able to do the things, to, to say the things that are going to make a difference. But you, you can. And so um, I offer freely my life to be used by you now in this time. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask these things. Amen. Hey, thanks for standing up. You may be seated. Verse number 6 of Psalm 1 has always grabbed my attention. I, th I think it will yours here in just a second when we look at it. Look down, look down at, the, at the end of the psalm, verse number 6, and I'm going to give the reference, and I want you to read it out loud with me, all right? So I'm going to say the reference, and you read it out loud with me. Psalm 1, verse 6. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let's try it one more time. Psalm 1, 6. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Okay, now, now look, look up here and let me ask you again a question. Um, is, is it true that the way of the ungodly shall perish? Yes. yes. Okay, this is, this is true. It's true. If the Bible is true at all, then those who thumb their nose at God, those who say, God, I don't care about what you have to say. I'm going to live my life 
the way I want to. I'm going to shoot into my body what I want to shoot. I'm going to drink what I want to drink. I'm going to say what I want to say. I'm going to go where I want to go. I'm going to act the way I want to act. I care not about what you say. People who are ungodly, that is, who care not for God, the Bible says that their way, the way of the ungodly shall perish. Well, that's certainly true eternally, isn't it? People who reject God eternally are going to be punished, but this psalm is specifically speaking of our life now. Uh, so that the people who reject God, they bring on themselves the judgment of God. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Think. I know it's Sunday school, but you can think anyway. Um, who is it that sees to it that the way of the ungodly perish? Is that, is that my responsibility? In other words, am I as a preacher supposed to look around and say, ah, 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 I don't think you're being godly. I think you're yawning during Sunday school. Oh, let me make sure your way perishes as an ungodly person. Is that, is that, uh, is that, is it my responsibility? Or is it your responsibility? Obviously not. I'm being silly with it this morning. Brother Andrew thinks it's his responsibility. Okay. No, obviously, obviously that's not true. I'm sorry, Brother Charles. I'll, I will get back here and try to stand still because no, you keep fine. on chasing me with this thing all over that's the place. Fine. I'll he's do my awake. best. He, he sleeps otherwise. Okay. Well, I'll keep moving. Then. <laughs> so it's not, it's not my responsibility. The responsibility really is God. And he's perfect at it. Now, admittedly, admittedly, when I, when I look around at um, people in this world and I see the way some people live ungodly and they seem to just absolutely uh, despise, almost like they're looking for ways to be as bad as they can and then I don't see immediate punishment to them, sometimes I think to myself, God, where are you? Isn't it? I mean... The way of the ungodly shall perish. Aren't you going to take care of it? But the fact of the matter is, is that God always does. God always does see to it that the way of the ungodly shall perish. And even if a person physically um, lives long, that doesn't tell you the state of the inside of them, does it? So that a person might be alive on the outside, but on the inside, things just, I mean, to live at, without peace on the inside and to live dead on the inside is, is death in and of itself. So yeah, the way of the ungodly perishes, and God says, I'll see to it that that happens. Okay, so the end of verse number six is true, that the way of the ungodly perishes, and it is God who sees to it that that happens. So if that is true, then the first part of verse number six is also true. And I want you to think, because look, look down at the verse, and we're going to read the first part of verse number six. I'm going to give the reference, and I want you to read to the colon, there that's halfway through the verse. Here we go. Psalm 1, verse 6. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. Let's read it together. Here we go. Psalm 1, 6a. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. Okay, so here's what the verse is teaching. And this is really what the psalm is about. While it is true that the way of the ungodly perishes, and God is the one who makes sure it happens, verse 6, first part says, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Meaning... It is also God who makes sure that people who live righteously get the blessing that he promises. Now that encourages me because sometimes I feel like, well, God, I'm, I'm doing right. The best of my knowledge, I am doing what you want me to do. I'm following your way. I'm, I'm I'm living life the way you want me to, God, and, and things aren't going as well for me as what I, thought, what I thought they would. Well, two things. Number one, God does know the way of the righteous. God is aware of people who live right, and God will see to it that they can live blessed. Secondly, blessing, blessedness, the ah, sigh of happiness is not something that is dependent on my circumstances around me. It is something that happens inside. But let me ask you a, a true or false quiz. And again, you can answer out loud at Sunday school. It is better to be poor than destitute. True or false? But destitute means you have nothing. Poor means you have very little. So it's better to be poor than destitute. True or false? Okay. Some of you refuse to answer. Um, how many of you would rather have a little bit than nothing at all? May I see your hand? You'd rather have a little than... Thank you very much. Um, true or false, it is better to be rich than poor. True. Depends on my 
Okay, how many of you would rather have a lot than a little bit? And don't, don't, don't grow pious on me all of a sudden. How many of you would rather have a lot than a little? Let me see your hands. Okay, so yes, it's better to be rich than poor. Um, true or false? It's better to be satisfied than rich. Yes. yes. Okay, see, so that, that's the point. That's the point. And regardless of if I'm rich, poor, or destitute, if I'm satisfied, then that's the best. So when God here says, look, I know the way of the righteous, what he's saying is, I'm aware of people who are following me, people who are doing what I say, who live in obedience to what I've laid out for them, and to those people, I have a promise. And when God makes a promise, he always keeps it. And his promise to you who will follow his way is, look, you'll be able to live blessed, satisfied, better than rich, better than money, better than peace from the outside, better than having people love you or accept you, better than all of that is. Satisfaction. Blessedness. Okay, so the first part of the psalm then deals with the practicalities. Of how, how is this accomplished? How is it that I follow God in such a way so that God notices me? How can I get God to notice me so that he gives to me this blessedness, that he gives to me this satisfaction, so that he knows my way? Um, for, verse 1 says this, psalm number 1. Look, look at it with me. Blessed, here we go, is the man, and then he, he gives the negative that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now, he mentions three things here, and for sake of time, we'll not deal with all three of these things. We just don't have time to do. But the first one is, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And by the way, if you'll take care of this one, the other two will not be a problem for you. Um, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. How many of you have ever made a decision based on counsel that you got from somebody. Somebody gave you advice and it was a it ended up being a bad decision. Have you has anybody ever made a bad decision? If you have a sibling, then this is true for you. Um, if you ever made a decision that ended up being a bad decision, you made it based upon what somebody told you, um, then you know what it is to have received what we would call bad counsel. In other words, they said, hey, well, let me give you a for instance. When I was in high school, um, I had a friend who was a notorious liar. I knew this about him, but for whatever reason, he was also a likable person, and he gave me counsel about some someone, about a, a friendship that I had, and he told me something about this person, and so I said something to this person based upon what he had told me. Well, he was a liar, and he told me a lie, and when I said this to this person, it made um, all kinds of repercussions. It blew up uh, a friendship, a relationship, all based upon what this person told me. And based upon bad counsel, I made a decision, and as a result. Now, now think for a second. When the person gave you counsel that ended up causing you to make a bad decision, um, did you know it was bad counsel when they gave it to you? Well, obviously not, or else you wouldn't have listened to them, right? I mean, if somebody gives you bad counsel, and you know it's bad counsel, then you go, hmm, thank you very much, I think I'll try this way. However, if someone gives you counsel, and it either feels good to you, or it sounds good to you, or you think, oh yeah, that makes sense to me, and then you make a decision, and even if, whether it's good counsel or bad counsel, if it feels good, it sounds good, then the temptation is, well, let me, let me take this route. However, there are people... Um, that will give you back counsel in life. So the deal is then, okay, how can I eliminate? How can I stop getting bad counsel? And God tells us this. Now, this is important. Teenagers, listen to this. This is going to be valuable for you because you're going to have people trying to give you counsel all the time. And there's going to be times in your life, a lot of times in our lives, as teenagers, as adults, where we need counsel. That is, I don't know what to do. How many, how many of you are parents? in this room right now. Okay, so you're going to need counsel. I mean, all of us all of us do when it comes to raising kids. Or if you have a job, then you, then you need counsel. If you're in school, then you need counsel. Whatever your situation, all of us are constantly needing counsel. So then what i got to do is find out a way to eliminate counsel that's going to cause me to make decisions that are going to be hurtful to my life 
or to my family or to the situations that I find myself in. And God here says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Okay, now this is so helpful. Because I can just right at the outset look at the life of a person who is counseling me. And if that person's life is ungodly, then immediately I know that I, that I, that I, don't, I don't need to listen to that person. Okay, now if you're thinking, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, but Tim, couldn't somebody who is ungodly give me good counsel in some areas of life? Now this is, this is something you've got to think through. Because my first, my first thought is, well, what about money? Aren't there ungodly people who could counsel me about uh, investing or where or how to put my money away? I mean, could I get could I get good counsel from somebody that is ungodly? Okay. Time out. Two things. Number one, I will tell you that an ungodly person, if for some reason this ungodly person has counsel that comes from, that, that matches the Word of God, that yes, I could listen to that counsel, but that's kind of like taking a good sandwich out of a trash can. In other words, why would I if I don't have to? Wouldn't it be better for me to get counsel about anything and everything from somebody that's, that's good and godly? Um, and when it comes to things, the second thing is, um, when it comes to things like money where you might, where you might not think to yourself, oh, I, don't, I don't know how to handle this, but here's a person, uh, they may be ungodly, but they're good with money, so let me ask them. I will, I will tell you that an ungodly person is ungodly even about money. In other words, their whole, their whole mindset about, about finances is going to be different than what yours and mine is. Now, God speaks to how we ought to spend money and how we ought to live life and how I ought to treat my friends and treat my family and how I ought to think about everything in life so that if I'm going to get counsel and, and have my way be blessed, have God see my way, then God says, hey, look, here's basic. Here's 101. Here's how to have a life that is blessed. It starts by saying, okay, if it's an ungodly person with ungodly counsel, nope, not listening to it. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners. He doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. But then the Bible turns and gives the positive side of here's how to live your life blessed so that God sees your way and you can live satisfied. But the Bible says instead, his delight... His enjoyment is in the law of the Lord, and in this law doth he meditate day and night. His delight, the word, the word delight means to love or to lean toward. Um, for, for 15 years, my wife and I, Britton and I, worked at, at the Bill Rice Ranch. See my hand chair. We worked at the Bill Rice Ranch in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. You guys, most of you are familiar with it, but it's a camping ministry where we have uh, several hundred young people every week that come from all over the United States, uh, and they come and they compete, and, and we preach the gospel, preach and preach the Bible too. It's a great place. We we are very grateful for um, their part in our ministry and our being a part of that ministry. One of the things that I learned about <laughs> about working with teenagers at camp is that it doesn't take long at this age group, like 13 to 19, for guys and girls to see each other and fall desperately in love. You know, we have, we have groups from, uh, from Southern Florida, you all, and then we have groups from Northern Michigan, and they come at the same time to the Bill Rice Ranch. In the first day, by, by Monday afternoon, by Monday evening, by Tuesday latest, here'll be, here'll be a guy and a girl who um, they, they, they see each other and they just know that this is the one for whom their soul, their soul has always longed. And uh, we, have, we have, after evening services, we have a place called the Rec Center, which is a, it's where the basketball court is, and there's bleachers around, and then it's at Cowboy Town, so you can buy all kinds of health food, uh, like nachos and cheese and ices and ice cream and things like that. And so here's this guy, here's this guy and this girl, 
the girl from northern Michigan, the guy from southern Florida, and they come to the Bill Rice Ranch, and they, they found each other. They're, they're in love. And they'll, <laughs> they'll come, and they'll sit at the bleachers. Now, we have a rule at the ranch that guys and girls are not allowed to touch each other. And we have workers that are spread out in, you know, hiding in bushes with shotguns that shoot anybody. <laughs> that, just kidding. But, um, but we make sure that we want them to have a clear conscience. So here's this guy and this girl. I mean, they... they they're, they're, they're in love. So they're sitting down on the bleachers and they're watching, they're watching people play basketball and they're just sitting there. Just sitting there, like 13 or 14 years old. You know? They're just sitting there. And it's not, it's, not like, it's not like they're sitting there having a normal conversation. It's not like, <clears throat> hey, what's your last name? It's nothing like that. <laughs> they just, they sit on the bleachers and there's something, there's something, now they're not allowed to touch, but there's something magical about the kneecap and the shoulder because they'll just kind of lean towards each other. And they're sitting there watching the basketball game and the guy is thinking, oh, man, I wish I could be playing basketball right now. And the girl is thinking, oh, I wish he would take a shower. And uh, they're, sitting, they're sitting there at camp. But this is, this is how it goes for three days. Now, I, when, I, when I'm telling this to guys and girls at camp, I say, I tell, I tell the guys, guys, look, you need to know that this girl does this every summer. Here, here's the deal. She comes and she finds some unsuspecting guy who has enough money to buy nachos and cheese for her all week. She has the goodbye letter written on Wednesday. She's just waiting until Friday to give it to the guy so she can soak him for all he's worth and get everything that she can. And then I tell the girls, girls, if you can find a guy who will fall for it, have at it. Take everything he has and, uh, and uh, leave him penniless. Let him get used to it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it was a joke. It was a joke, Pete. So here they are. They're sitting there, and they're just kind of, uh, they're just kind of leaning towards each other. Okay, when the Bible says, a person's delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, this is, this is in a um, frivolous, silly way. But when the Bible says his delight is in the law of the Lord, the idea is that there, there's a desire. Probably, probably a better illustration is a husband and wife or someone who's engaged where they're significantly, like, like they've committed to each other. And a husband who loves his wife the decisions that he's going to make for the family, um, in all the decisions he's thinking about, okay, how does this affect my wife? How does this affect my family? And there's a, a leaning towards, a love towards what, what she thinks is important and how she feels is important, and there's just a, a love and a leaning toward. Um, if you've ever seen someone recently married, like if you're at church and someone's newly married and you're sitting behind them, and it looks like, from, from behind, it looks like one body, two heads, coming out because they're sitting real close together, then um, that, that's, that's the idea. When the Bible says that his delight is in the law of the Lord, there's a, there is a love, an appreciation, a, a learning. Okay, but this is where oftentimes, don't, don't be careful. This is where oftentimes we, we preachers would say something like, and it's true, hey, be sure to have your devotions. You need to love the word of God, so get in the Bible and read it, and that is true. However, if it just is a matter of let me read the Bible so that I can have my guilty feeling gone, and that's it, well, then, then you're missing the whole point. The point is not just delight in, in the sense that, oh, I really like to read. I have my Our Daily Bread or my Glow or whatever it is, your devotional book that you go through. Um, and, that, and that's it. That, that's not the point. Delighting in the word and law of the Lord doesn't mean just read it and get understand it, but it means read it, understand it, and to live by it. In other words, it becomes my law for life. It becomes my rule of life, my, my, my light, my guiding light. Um, in the New Testament, the Bible says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Meaning, not, hey, memorize the Bible, though that's a good thing to do. But when the Bible says, dwell in you richly, the idea is almost like an umpire. You know, umpire is the one who stands behind the catcher in a baseball games and calls out balls or strikes when the pitch is thrown. So the pitch is thrown and the umpire is there watching it and he says, ah, that's a strike. 
And uh, if it's outside the play or outside the parameters, then he'll say that's a ball. He's the one who says, you can argue with the umpire if you want to. He's not going to change his call. He calls balls and strikes. Okay, so this is, this is the idea where the Bible becomes the, yes, that is right. That is good. No, that should not be a part of my life. And that, that is when all of a sudden the word of Christ dwells in me. That is when I am leaning toward, where I'm delighting in the law of the Lord so that it is a part of my life. This is... I will tell you, as a parent, now a lot of things in, in a lot of things right now are applying in my heart, and my mind, as a parent, because that's where I, I mean, that's where I am right now. I have a uh, a ten-year-old and a five-year-old and a two-year-old. The two-year-old and five-year-old, it's obedience, 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 right now. But I got a ten-year-old, and it's it's transferring from obedience to ah, I got to make sure he gets the reason why we're obeying. There's, there's this this has got to get into him. And so, um, as a parent, it is my desire to put into him a desire, to get into him, to see in, in, in my boys a desire to follow and love the Word and the law of God. But I will tell you, as a parent, man, that's got to start with me. If, if I am attempting to shove that into them, but from me there's, there, I'm not doing that myself, then uh, forgive the phrase, but I don't have a prayer of getting it into them. Now, God can work outside of me. I get that. But the whole plan is that, I, that I'm able to show this and give this to them. All right, so whether you're a parent or not, whether you're raising kids or not, look, all of us, all of us, all of us want to be happy. All of us want to be blessed. And here's the great news. God wants you to, too. God wants you to as well. He wants you to be blessed, to be happy, to <sighs> live this way. So what he says is, look, don't listen to ungodly counsel. Delight in. Cause yourself, give yourself the opportunity to love and lean toward and live by what the scriptures have to say. Then he says, here's what here's what will happen to you in verse number three. And this is this is where we'll finish up our time here. He, and he, this is the person who delights in the law of the Lord. Verse number three, look at it, please. And he shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Okay, so four things he mentions in verse number three. The, this is what God does. This is what happens to those who delight and who love God's word, who follow what God has to say. Number one, the Bible says that he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That is, he'll have his needs met. Every, everything I need as a person to grow, everything that I need as a believer, as a Christian, to grow, to, to get stronger, I will have all of my needs met. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Um, here, here's a tree that is uh, by a river of water. It has its sustenance, everything it needs. It gets from the water. Uh, same tree in the middle of the field with no water. Well, it's in trouble, isn't it? I mean, it's not, it's not going to grow. It can't because it needs, a tree needs water to grow. A person, a Christian especially, needs the scriptures, needs the Bible as a part of their life in order to get stronger. Okay, so he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His needs are met. Number two, it says his leaf also, I'm sorry, let me make sure I'm doing this in the right order because that doesn't sound right to me. Uh, like a tree planted by the rivers of water, uh, bring it forth as fruit in the season. All right, so um, he'll produce. Um, he'll bring forth fruit in his season. Now, this, a couple things about this. Number one, the Bible says that if I will delight in, if I choose God's word, I will bring forth fruit. But it also says in his season. Here's the deal. Hey, look. Don't get, don't get discouraged if when following God's way, if you make the decision, I'm going to live by, love God's word, I'm going to do what's right, regardless of what other people do around me, regardless of how I feel on the inside, I delight in, I choose God's word. Don't get discouraged when things don't just all of a sudden explode into, um, into you seeing all the fruit of this, where, where your life is completely at ease and peace. There, it takes time. It takes time. I don't know all the reasons why, why God works this way. I really don't. 
admittedly that sometimes I think to myself, God, I sure would love it if everybody that did right was really, really blessed and everybody that did wrong was really, really punished. Mm. Then there would be a clear difference until, of course, I'm the one that's doing really, really wrong. And then I say, thank God that it takes time and thank you, God, for being so merciful. I don't want you to have mercy, but I want some. You understand? Okay. So I don't understand all the ways of God. Why, why would God allow this to take time? I don't, I don't know. It could be, it could be that um, that God is always constantly strengthening us, and that happens through exercise. That 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 is true. I, I don't know the mind of God, but here's what I do know: that I can listen. I can believe God, and if God says that He knows the way of the righteous, then I can lean on love, learn, and live by His Word, and I can know that eventually I will bring forth fruit in the season that God has for me. It may take some time, but it's going to happen. So we see that the provision is taken care of, um, the production is taken care of. Verse number 3 then says, His leaf also shall not wither. That's protection. Uh, protection. Um, all right, let's go back to the tree. Um, tree planted by the rivers of water produces and it has everything that it needs. A tree in the middle of the field without water, a different situation. Hey, let me ask you, let me ask you a question, all you scientists out here. What is it that helps build up the tree's strength? Um, a tree that's by a river of water that has, that has all its nutrients, everything it needs, what is it that helps outside of the water? What else in nature, I'm just talking about a natural tree, what else in nature helps a tree to get stronger as it has the water that it needs. Sunlight. Sunlight. Okay, photosynthesis, which comes from the sun. All right. Same tree, away from water, same sun. What is it that dries up and kills a tree? The sun. The sun. So that the sun to a tree without water kills it. The sun to a tree with water strengthens it. There is protection. There's protection from temptation and uh, the constant struggle to do right and to think, to think right, to live right. There's protection. When I love the word and law of God and I live by it, then the, then the temptation and struggles that just happen in life generally, if I'm connected to God, those strengthen me. When I get disconnected from God, if I'm not in the Word of God and letting the Word of God dwell in my heart, I'm talking about more than just on Sunday morning, but I mean as a life, as a thought process, when I get separated from that, then those same pressures from the world around me absolutely destroy my life on the inside. There is protection that comes when I love and lean toward the Word of God. Okay, so I have provision, I have production, I have protection, and then lastly, I love this, the Bible says prosperity. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So the person who delights in the Word of God, he shall prosper. All right, so if you want to make a million dollars, delight in the law of the Lord. If you want to have health, wealth, and um, a house that is three stories high and huge and right on the water, all you have to do is delight in the word of the Lord, and then whatsoever you do will prosper, and that's all that matters. Just send in your seed of faith to me, and you'll be wealthy in no time at all. Is that, is that what the Bible is saying? No. Okay, this goes back to the very beginning. Uh, now, 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 I will say this. I don't ever have to protect God from his word. And you don't either. That is, if God did promise that, then I wouldn't have to protect God from it. He's big enough to handle it, isn't he? Okay. So, this goes back, however, to the very beginning, which is, it's better to be poor than destitute. It's better to be rich than poor, but it's better to be satisfied than rich. This, this, this is what this is all about. Whatsoever I do, I shall prosper. And when I'm connected to the Word of God, I'm listening to the Word of God, I'm getting counsel, it's godly counsel, and helping me to do what's right. Hey, let me tell you something. I am on the way of being able to live a life, whether I have much or little, whether I have a mansion or a cottage or a trailer or a vehicle to live in. I have the opportunity 
given by God to be able to live <sighs> satisfied. Amen. So that a teenager who has a drunk for a dad who delights in the law of the Lord himself can live satisfied. Or an adult who has pressures from, from work and from family who delights in the law of the Lord can in the midst of that live satisfied. And if my health is good or my health is bad, I can live satisfied if I'm delighting in the law of the Lord. And who is it that is the guarantor? Who is it that sees to it that the way of the righteous is seen and shall prosper? Who, who takes care of that? God. God does. And he's never dropped anybody. He's not going to start with us. Okay, so here's the deal. Delight in the law of the Lord. Choose God. In, in your life, why, why don't you just make the decision? Yeah, I'm going I'm to read, but I'm going to read with the intent to let this be the guiding light of my life. I'm going to get godly counsel and get help from things I don't understand in the scriptures. I'm going to ask the Spirit of God. I'm going to get help, but I want to live by what the Word of God has to say. And when God reveals to you things in your life that aren't quite right, then, oh man, God, whew, I want, I, I choose your way of blessedness, not my way. Amen. And let God And let God have your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, please help us to live in accordance to what your word has for us here and teaches us. Um, God, I pray that you would, you would give, help us with desire, help us with um, seeing how to delight in your way. Speak to us, please, by your word, even this morning. Speak to us by your word and show us what it is that you'd have us to do. And help us, dear God, to trust you and to not look to anything or anyone else for satisfaction or blessedness, but to trust that you know the way of the righteous. We love you, Father. You're a good God. It's a pleasure to serve you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you're dismissed until service time.